The Homely Heroine by Edna Ferber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. The Homely Heroine by Edna Ferber. Millie Whitcomb of the Fancy Goods and Notions beckoned me with her finger. I had been standing at Kate O'Malley's counter, pretending to admire her new basket-weave suitings, but in reality reveling in her droll account of how, in the train coming up from Chicago, Mrs. Judge Porterfield had worn the negro porter's coat over her chilly shoulders in mistake for her husband's. Kate O'Malley can tell a funny story in a way to make the after-dinner pleasantries of a Washington diplomat sound like the clumsy jests told around the village grocery stove. "'I wanted to tell you that I read that last story of yours,' said Millie sociably, when I had strolled over to her counter, and I liked it, all but the heroine. She had an adorable throat, and hair that waved away from her white brow, and eyes that now were blue and now gray. Say, why don't you write a story about an ugly girl? My land, protested I. It's bad enough trying to make them accept my stories as it is. The last heroine was a raving beauty, but she came back eleven times before the editor of Blakely succumbed to her charms. Millie's fingers were busy straightening the contents of a tray of combs and imitation jet barrettes. Millie's fingers were not intended for that task. They are slender, tapering fingers, pink-tipped and sensitive. I should think, mused she, rubbing a cloudy piece of jet with a bit of soft cloth, that they'd welcome a homely one with relief. These goddesses are so cloying. Millie Whitcomb's black hair is touched with soft mists of gray, and she wears lavender shirt-waists and white stocks edged with lavender. There is a colonial air about her that has nothing to do with celluloid combs and imitation jet barrettes. It breathes of dim old rooms, rich with the tones of mahogany and old brass, and Millie in the midst of it, gray-gowned, a soft white fichu crossed upon her breast. In our town the clerks are not the pert and gum-chewing young persons that story-writers are wont to describe. The girls at Bascom's are institutions. They know us all by our first names, and our lives are as an open book to them. Kate O'Malley, who has been at Bascom's for so many years that she is rumored to have stock in the company, may be said to govern the fashions of our town. She is wont to say, when we express a fancy for gray is the color of our new spring suit, Oh, now, Nellie, don't get gray again. You had it year before last. And don't you think it was just the least little bit trying? Let me show you that green that came in Saturday. I said the minute I clapped my eyes on it that it was just the color for you, with your brown hair and all. And we end by deciding on the green. The girls at Bascom's are not gossips. They are too busy for that. But they may be said to be delightfully well-informed. How could they be otherwise, when we go to Bascom's for our wedding dresses and party favors and baby flannels? There is news at Bascom's that our daily paper never hears of and wouldn't dare to print if it did. So when Millie Whitcomb of the Fancy Goods and Notions expressed her hunger for a homely heroine, I did not resent the suggestion. On the contrary, it sent me home in a thoughtful mood for Millie Whitcomb has acquired a knowledge of human nature in the dispensing of her fancy goods and notions. It set me casting about for a really homely heroine. There never has been a really ugly heroine in fiction. Authors have started bravely out to write of an unlovely woman, but they never have had the courage to allow her to remain plain. On page 237 she puts on a black lace dress and red roses, and the combination brings out unexpected tawny lights in her hair and olive tints in her cheeks, and there she is, the same old beautiful heroine. Even in the Duchess books one finds the simple Irish girl, 
on donning a green corduroy gown cut square at the neck, transformed into a wild rose beauty, at sight of whom a ballroom is hushed into admiring awe. That's the case of Jane Eyre, too. She is constantly described as plain and mouse-like, but there are covert hints as to her gray eyes and slender figure and clear skin, and we have a sneaking notion that she wasn't such a fright after all. Therefore, when I tell you that I am choosing Pearlie Schultz as my leading lady, you are to understand that she is ugly, not only when the story opens, but to the bitter end. In the first place, Pearlie is fat, not plump, or rounded, or dimpled, or deliciously curved, but fat. She bulges in all the wrong places, including her chin. Sister, who has a way of snooping over my desk in my absence, says that I may as well drop this now because nobody would ever read it, anyway, least of all any sane editor. I protest when I discover that Sis has been over my papers. It bothers me. But she says you have to do these things when you have a genius in the house, and cites the case of Kipling's recessional, which was rescued from the depths of his wastebasket by his wife. Pearlie Schultz used to sit on the front porch summer evenings and watch the couples stroll by and weep in her heart. A fat girl with a fat girl's soul is a comedy, but a fat girl with a thin girl's soul is a tragedy. Pearlie, in spite of her two hundred pounds, had the soul of a willow wand. The walk in front of Pearlie's house was guarded by a row of big trees that cast kindly shadows. The strolling couples used to step gratefully into the embrace of these shadows, and from them into other embraces. Pearlie, sitting on the porch, could see them dimly, although they could not see her. She could not help remarking that these strolling couples were strangely lacking in sprightly conversation. Their remarks were but fragmentary, disjointed affairs, spoken in low tones with a queer tremulous note in them. When they reached the deepest, blackest, kindliest shadow, which fell just before the end of the row of trees, the strolling couples almost always stopped, and then there came a quick movement, and a little smothered cry from the girl, and then a sound, and then a silence. Pearlie, sitting alone on the porch in the dark, listened to these things and blushed furiously. Pearlie had never strolled into the kindly shadows with a little beating of the heart, and she had never been surprised with a quick arm about her and eager lips pressed warmly against her own. In the daytime Pearlie worked as public stenographer at the Burke Hotel. She rose at seven in the morning, and rolled for fifteen minutes, and lay on her back and elevated her heels in the air, and stood stiff-kneed while she touched the floor with her fingertips one hundred times, and went without her breakfast. At the end of each month she usually found that she weighed three pounds more than she had the month before. The folks at home never joked with Pearlie about her weight. Even one's family has some respect for a life's sorrow. Whenever Pearlie asked that inevitable question of the fat woman, Am I as fat as she is? Her mother always answered, You? Well, I should hope not. You're looking real peaked lately, Pearlie, and your blue skirt just ripples in the back it's getting so big for you. Of such blessed stuff are mothers made. But if the gods had denied Pearlie all charms of face and form, they had been decent enough to bestow on her one gift. Pearlie could cook like an angel, no, better than an angel, for no angel could be a really clever cook and wear those flowing kimono-like sleeves. They'd get into the soup. Pearlie could take a piece of rump and some suet and an onion and a cup or so of water and evolve a pot roast that you could cut with a fork. She could turn out a surprisingly good cake with surprisingly few eggs all covered with white icing and bearing cunning little jelly figures on its snowy bosom. She could beat up biscuits that fell apart at the lightest pressure, revealing little pools of gold and butter within. Oh, Pearlie could cook! On weekdays Pearlie rattled the typewriter keys, but on Sundays she shooed her mother out of the kitchen. Her mother went protesting faintly. Now, Pearlie, dear, don't fuss so for dinner. 
You ought to get your rest on Sunday instead of stewing over a hot stove all morning. Hot fiddlesticks, Ma, Pearlie would say cheerily. It ain't hot because it's a gas stove, and I'll only get fat if I sit around. You put on your black and white and go to church. Call me when you've got as far as your corsets, and I'll puff your hair for you in the back. In her capacity of public stenographer at the Burke Hotel, it was Pearlie's duty to take letters dictated by traveling men and beginning, Yours of the tenth at hand, in reply would say, or, Enclosed, please find, etc. As clenching proof of her plainness, it may be stated that none of the traveling men, not even Max Baum, who was so fresh that the girl at the cigar counter actually had to squelch him, ever called Pearlie Baby Doll, or tried to make a date with her. Not that Pearlie would ever have allowed them to. But she never had had to reprove them. During pauses in dictation she had a way of peering nearsightedly over her glasses at the dapper, well-dressed traveling salesman who was rolling off the items of his sale bill. That is a trick which would make the prettiest kind of girl look owlish. On the night that Sam Miller strolled up to talk to her, Pearlie was working late. She had promised to get out a long and intricate bill for Max Baum, who travels for Kuhn and Klingman, so that he might take the nine o'clock evening train. The irrepressible Max had departed with much eclat and clatter, and Pearlie was preparing to go home when Sam approached her. Sam had come in from the Gaiety Theatre across the street, whither he had gone in a vain search for amusement after supper. He had come away in disgust. A soiled soubrette with orange-colored hair and baby socks had swept her practiced eye over the audience and, attracted by Sam's good-looking blonde head in the second row, had selected him as the target of her song. She had run up to the extreme edge of the footlights at the risk of teetering over and had informed Sam, through the medium of song, to the huge delight of the audience and to Sam's red-faced discomfiture, that she liked his smile, and he was just her style, and just as cute as he could be, and just the boy for her. On reaching the chorus she had whipped out a small, round mirror, and, assisted by the calcium-light man in the rear, had thrown a wretched little spotlight on Sam's head. Ordinarily Sam would not have minded it, but that evening, in the vest pocket, just over the place where he supposed his heart to be, reposed his girl's daily letter. They were to be married on Sam's return to New York from his first long trip. In the letter near his heart she had written prettily and seriously about traveling men and traveling men's wives, and her little code for both. The fragrant, girlish, grave little letter had caused Sam to sour on the efforts of the soiled soubrette. As soon as possible he had fled up the aisle and across the street to the hotel writing-room. There he had spied Pearlie's good-humored, homely face, and its contrast with the silly red-and-white countenance of the unlaundered soubrette had attracted his homesick heart. Pearlie had taken some letters from him earlier in the day. Now, in his hunger for companionship, he strolled up to her desk just as she was putting her typewriter to bed. "'Gee, this is a lonesome town,' said Sam, smiling down at her. Pearlie glanced up at him over her glasses. "'I guess you must be from New York,' she said. "'I've heard a real New Yorker can get bored in Paris. In New York the sky is bluer, and the grass is greener, and the girls are prettier, and the stakes are thicker, and the buildings are higher, and the streets are wider, and the air is finer than the sky, or the grass, or the girls, or the stakes, or the air of any place else in the world, ain't they?" "'Oh, now,' protested Sam, "'quit kidding me. You'd be lonesome for the little old town, too, if you'd been born and dragged up in it, and hadn't seen it for four months.' "'New to the road, aren't you?' asked Pearlie. Sam blushed a little. How did you know? Well, you generally can tell. They don't know what to do with themselves evenings, and they look rebellious when they go into the dining room. The old-timers just look resigned. You've picked up a thing or two around here, haven't you? 
I wonder if the time will ever come when I'll look resigned to a hotel dinner after four months of them. Why, girl, I've got so I just eat the things that are covered up, like baked potatoes in the shell, and soft-boiled eggs, and baked apples and oranges that I can peel, and nuts. Why, you poor kid, breathed Pearlie, her pale eyes fixed on him in motherly pity. You oughtn't to do that. You'll get so thin your girl won't know you. Sam looked up quickly. How in thunderation did you know? Pearlie was pinning on her hat and she spoke succinctly, her hat-pins between her teeth. "'You've been here two days now, and I notice you dictate all your letters except the longest one, and you write that one off in a corner of the writing-room all by yourself, with your cigar just glowing like a live coal, and you squint up through the smoke and grin to yourself. "'Say, would you mind if I walked home with you?' asked Sam. If Pearlie was surprised, she was woman enough not to show it. She picked up her gloves and handbag, locked her drawer with a click, and smiled her acquiescence. And when Pearlie smiled, she was awful. It was a glorious evening in the early summer, moonless, velvety, and warm. As they strolled homeward, Sam told her all about the girl, as is the way of traveling men the world over. He told her about the tiny apartment they had taken, and how he would be on the road only a couple of years more, as this was just a tryout that the firm always insisted on, and they stopped under an arc light while Sam showed her the picture in his watch, as is also the way of traveling men since time immemorial. Pearlie made an excellent listener. He was so boyish and so much in love and so pathetically eager to make good with the firm, and so happy to have someone in whom to confide. But it's a dog's life after all, reflected Sam, again after the fashion of all traveling men. Any fellow on the road earns his salary these days, you bet. I used to think he was all getting up when you felt like it and sitting in the big front window of the hotel, smoking a cigar and watching the pretty girls go by. I wasn't wise to the packing and the unpacking and the rotten train service and the grouchy customers and the canceled bills and the grub. Pearlie nodded understandingly. A man told me once that twice a week, regularly, he dreamed of the way his wife cooked noodle soup. My folks are German, explained Sam, and my mother, she can cook. Well, I just don't seem able to get her potato pancakes out of my mind, and her roast beef tasted and looked like roast beef, and not like a wet red flannel rag. At that moment Pearlie was seized with a brilliant idea. Tomorrow's Sunday. You're going to Sunday here, aren't you? Come over and eat your dinner with us. If you have forgotten the taste of real food, I can give you a dinner that'll jog your memory. Oh, really, protested Sam. You're awfully good, but I couldn't think of it. I— You needn't be afraid. I'm not letting you in for anything. I may be homelier than an English suffragette, and I know my lines are all bumps, but there's one thing you can't take away from me, and that's my cooking hand. I can cook, boy, in a way to make your mother's Sunday dinner, with company expected, look like Mrs. Newlywed's first attempt at Riz Biscuits. And I don't mean any disrespect to your mother when I say it. I'm going to have noodle soup and fried chicken and hot biscuits and creamed beans from our own garden, and strawberry shortcake with real— Hush! shouted Sam. If I ain't there, you'll know that I passed away during the night, and you can telephone the clerk to break in my door. The Grim Reaper spared him, and Sam came, and was introduced to the family, and ate. He put himself in a class with Dr. Johnson, and Ben Burst, and Gargantua, only that his table manners were better. He almost forgot to talk during the soup, and he came back three times for chicken, and by the time the strawberry shortcake was half consumed, he was looking at Pearlie with a sort of awe in his eyes. That night he came over to say good-bye before taking his train out for Ishpeming. 
He and Pearlie strolled down as far as the park and back again. "'I didn't eat any supper,' said Sam. "'It would have been sacrilege after that dinner of yours. Honestly, I don't know how to thank you, being so good to a stranger like me. When I come back next trip, I expect to have the kid with me, and I want her to meet you by George. She's a winner and a pippin, but she wouldn't know whether a porterhouse was stewed or frapped. I'll tell her about you, you bet. In the meantime, if there's anything I can do for you, I'm yours to command." Pearlie turned to him suddenly. You see that clump of thick shadows ahead of us, where those big trees stand in front of our house?" Sure, replied Sam. Well, when we step into that deepest, blackest shadow right in front of our porch, I want you to reach up and put your arm around me and kiss me on the mouth just once, and when you get back to New York you can tell your girl I asked you to." There broke from him a little involuntary exclamation. It might have been of pity, and it might have been of surprise. It had in it something of both, but nothing of mirth. And as they stepped into the depths of the soft black shadows, he took off his smart straw sailor, which was so different from the sailors that the boys in our town wear, and there was in the gesture something of reverence. Millie Whitcomb didn't like the story of the homely heroine after all. She says that a steady diet of such literary fare would give her blue indigestion. Also she objects on the ground that no one got married, uh, that is, the heroine didn't, and she says that a heroine who does not get married isn't a heroine at all. She thinks she prefers the pink-cheeked goddess kind in the end. End of The Homely Heroine A Bush League Hero by Edna Ferber This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Bush League Hero This is not a baseball story. The grandstand does not rise as one man and shout itself hoarse with joy. There isn't a three-bagger in the entire three thousand words, and nobody is carried home on the shoulders of the crowd. For that sort of thing you need not squander fifteen cents on your favorite magazine. The modest sum of one cent will make you the possessor of a pinkin. There you will find the season's games handled in masterly fashion by a six-best-seller artist, an expert mathematician, and an original slang humorist. No mere short story dub may hope to compete with these. In the old days, before the gentry of the ring had learned the wisdom of investing their winnings in solids instead of liquids, this used to be a favorite conundrum. When is a prize fighter not a prize fighter? Chorus. When he is tending bar. I rise to ask you, brother fan, when is a ball player not a ball player? Above the storm of facetious replies I shout the answer, when he's a shoe clerk. Any man who can look handsome in a dirty baseball suit is an Adonis. There is something about the baggy pants and the macabre-shaped collar and the skull-fitting cap and the foot or so of tan or blue or pink undershirt sleeve sticking out at the arms that just naturally kills a man's best points. Then, too, a baseball suit requires so much in the matter of leg. Therefore, when I say that Rudy Schlockweiler was a dream even in his baseball uniform, with a dirty brown streak right up the side of his pants where he had slid for base, you may know that the girls camped on the grounds during the season. During the summer months our ballpark is to us what the Grand Prix is to Paris or Ascot is to London. What care we that Evers gets seven thousand a year, or is it a month, or that Chicago's new South Side ballpark seats thirty-five thousand, or is it million? Of what interest are such meager items compared with the knowledge that Pug Coolin, who plays short, goes with Undine Myers, the girl up there in the eighth row with the pink dress and the red roses on her hat? 
When Pug snatches a high one out of the firmament, we yell with delight. And even as we yell, we turn sideways to look up and see how Undine is taking it. Undine's shining eyes are fixed on Pug, and he knows it, stoops to brush the dust off his dirt-begrimed baseball pants, takes an attitude of careless grace, and misses the next play. Our grandstand seats almost two thousand, counting the boxes. But only the snobs and the girls with new hats sit in the boxes. Box seats are comfortable, it is true, and they cost only an additional ten cents. But we have come to consider them undemocratic and unworthy of true fans. Mrs. Freddie Van Dyne, who spends her winters in Egypt and her summers at the ballpark, comes out to the game every afternoon in her automobile, but she never occupies a box seat, so why should we? She perches up in the grandstand with the rest of the enthusiasts, and when Kelly puts one over she stands up and clenches her fists and waves her arms and shouts with the best of them. She has even been known to cry, Good eye, good eye, when things were at fever heat. The only really blasé individual in the ballpark is Willie Grimes, who peddles ice cream cones. For that matter, I once saw Willie turn a languid head to pipe in his thin voice, Give him a dark one, Dutch, give him a dark one. Well, that will do for the first dash of local color. Now for the story. Ivy Keller came home June 19th from Miss Shant's Select School for Young Ladies. By June 21st she was bored limp. You could hardly see the pleats of her white tailored waist shirt for fraternity pins and secret society emblems, and her bedroom was ablaze with college banners and pennants to such an extent that the maid gave notice every Thursday, which was upstairs cleaning day. For two weeks after her return Ivy spent most of her time writing letters and waiting for them, and reading the classics on the front porch, dressed in a midi blouse and a blue skirt, with her hair done in a curly Greek effect like the girls on the covers of the ladies' magazine. She posed against the canvas bosom of the porch chair with one foot under her, the other swinging free, showing a tempting thing in beaded slipper, silk stocking, and what the story writers call slim ankle. On the second Saturday after her return, her father came home for dinner at noon, found her deep in volume two of Les Miserables. Phew, this is a scorcher, he exclaimed, and dropped down on a wicker chair next to Ivy. Ivy looked at her father with languid interest, and smiled a daughterly smile. Ivy's father was an insurance man, alderman of his ward, president of the Civic Improvement Club, member of five lodges, and a habitual delegate. It generally was he who introduced distinguished guests who spoke at the Opera House on Decoration Day. He called Mrs. Keller mother, and he wasn't above noticing the fit of a gown on a pretty feminine figure. He thought Ivy was an expurgated edition of Lillian Russell, Madame de Steel, and Mrs. Parkburst. "'Aren't you feeling well, Ivy?' he asked. "'Looking a little pale. It's the heat, I suppose. Gosh, something smells good. Run in and tell Mother I'm here.' Ivy kept one slender finger between the leaves of her book. "'I'm perfectly well,' she replied. "'That must be beefsteak and onions, ugh!' And she shuddered and went indoors. Dad Keller looked after her thoughtfully. Then he went in, washed his hands, and sat down at table with Ivy and her mother. "'Just a sliver for me,' said Ivy, "'and no onions.' Her father put down his knife and fork, cleared his throat, and spake thus. "'You get on your hat and meet me at the 245 Interurban. You're going to the ball game with me.' "'Ball game?' repeated Ivy. I? But I'd— Yes, you do, interrupted her father. You've been moping around here looking a cross between St. Cecilia and Little Eve long enough. I don't care if you don't know a spitball from a fadeaway when you see it. You'll be out in the air all afternoon, and there'll be some excitement. All the girls go. You'll like it. They're playing Marshalltown. Ivy went, looking the sacrificial lamb. 
Five minutes after the game was called, she pointed one tapering white finger in the direction of the pitcher's mound. Who's that? she asked. Pitcher, explained Papa Keller laconically. Then, patiently, he throws the ball. Oh, said Ivy. What did you say his name was? I didn't say, but it's Rudy Schlockweiler. The boys call him Dutch. Kind of a pet, Dutch is. Rudy Schlockweiler, murmured Ivy dreamily. What a strong name. Want some peanuts? inquired her father. Does one eat peanuts at a ball game? It ain't hardly legal if you don't, Pa Keller assured her. Uh, two sacks, said Ivy. Uh, Papa, why do they call it a diamond? And what are those brown bags at the corners? And what does it count if you hit the ball? And why do they rub their hands in the dust and then, uh, spit on them? And what salary does a pitcher get? And why does the red-haired man on the other side dance around like that between the second and third brown bag? And doesn't a pitcher do anything but pitch? And what— You're on, said Papa. After that, Ivy didn't miss a game during all the time that the team played in the home town. She went without a new hat, and didn't care whether Jean Valjean got away with the goods or not, and forgot whether you played third-hand high or low in bridge. She even became chummy with Undine Myers, who wasn't her kind of girl at all. Undine was thin, in a voluptuous kind of way, if such a paradox can be, and she had red lips and a roving eye, and she ran around downtown without a hat more than was strictly necessary. But Undine and Ivy had two subjects in common. They were baseball and love. It is queer how the limelight will make heroes of us all. Now Pug Coolin, who was red-haired, and had shoulders like an ox, and arms that hung down to his knees, like those of an orangutan, slaughtered beeves at the Chicago stockyards in winter. In the summer he slaughtered hearts. He wore mustard-colored shirts that matched his hair, and his baseball stockings generally had a rip in them somewhere, but when he was on the diamond we were almost ashamed to look at Undine, so wholly did her heart shine in her eyes. Now we'll just have another dash or two of local color. In a small town the chances for hero worship are few. If it weren't for the traveling men, our girls wouldn't know whether stripes or checks were the thing in gents' suitings. When the baseball season opened, the girls swarmed on it. Those that didn't understand baseball pretended they did. When the team was out of town, our form of greeting was changed from good morning or how do you do to what's the score. Every night the results of the games throughout the league were posted up on the blackboard in front of Schlager's hardware store, and to see the way in which the crowd stood around it and streamed across the street toward it, you'd have thought they were giving away gas stoves and hammock couches. Going home in the streetcar after the game, the girls used to gaze adoringly at the dirty faces of their sweat-begrimed heroes, and then they'd rush home, have supper, change their dresses, do their hair, and rush downtown past the Parker Hotel to mail their letters. The baseball boys boarded over at the Griggs house, which is third class, but they used their toothpicks and held the post-mortem of the day's game out in front of the Parker Hotel, which is our leading hostelry. The post office receipts record for our town was broken during the months of June, July, and August. Mrs. Freddie Van Dyne started the trouble by having the team over to dinner, Pug, Coolin, and all. After all, why not? No foreign and impecunious princes penetrate as far inland as our town. They only get as far as New York or Newport, where they are gobbled up by many moneyed matrons. If Mrs. Freddie Van Dyne found the supply of available lions limited, why should she not try to content herself with a jackal or so? Ivy was asked. Until then she had contented herself with gazing at her hero. She had become such a hardened baseball fan that she followed the game with a scorecard, accurately jotting down every play and keeping her watch open on her knee. She sat next to Rudy at dinner. Before she had nibbled her second salted almond, Ivy Keller and Rudy Schlockweiler understood each other. 
Rudy illustrated certain plays by drawing lines on the tablecloth with his knife, and Ivy gazed wide-eyed and allowed her soup to grow cold. The first night that Rudy called, Pa Keller thought it a great joke. He sat out on the porch with Rudy and Ivy and talked baseball, and got to show Rudy how he could have got the goat of that Keokuk catcher if only he had tried one of his famous open-faced throws. Rudy looked politely interested and laughed in all the right places, but Ivy didn't need to pretend. Rudy Schlockweiler spelled baseball to her. She did not think of her caller as a good-looking young man in a blue serge suit and a white shirtwaist. Even as he sat there, she saw him as a blond god standing on the pitcher's mound, with the scars of battle on his baseball pants, his left foot placed in front of him at right angles with his right foot, his gaze fixed on first base in a cunning effort to deceive the man at bat, in that favorite attitude of pitchers just before they get ready to swing their left leg and heist one over. The second time that Rudy called, Ma Keller said, Ivy, I don't like that ball player coming here to see you. The neighbors will talk. The third time Rudy called, Pa Keller said, What's that guy doing here again? The fourth time Rudy called, Pa Keller and Ma Keller said in unison, This thing has got to stop. But it didn't. It had had too good a start. For the rest of the season, Ivy met her knight of the sphere around the corner. Theirs was a walking courtship. They used to roam up as far as the state road and down as far as the river, and Rudy would fain have talked of love, but Ivy talked of baseball. Darling, Rudy would murmur, pressing Ivy's arm closer, when did you first begin to care? Why, I liked the very first game I saw when Dad— I mean, when did you first begin to care for me? Oh, when you put three men out in that game with Marshalltown, when the teams were tied in the eighth inning, remember? Say, Rudy, dear, what is the matter with your arm today? You let three men walk, and Albia's weakest hitter got a home run out of you. Oh, forget baseball for a minute, Ivy. Now let's talk about something else. Let's talk about us. Us? Well, you're baseball, aren't you? retorted Ivy. And if you are, I am. Did you notice the way that Otumwa man pitched yesterday? He didn't do any acting for the grandstand. He didn't reach up above his head and wrap his right shoulder with his left toe and swing his arm three times and then throw seven inches outside the plate. He just took the ball in his hand, looked at it curiously for a moment, and fired it, zing, like that, over the plate. I'd get that ball if I were you. Isn't this a grand night? murmured Rudy. But they didn't have a hitter in the bunch, went on Ivy, and not a man in the team could run. That's why they're tail-enders. Just the same, that man on the mound was a wizard, and if he had one decent player to give him some support, well, the thing came to a climax. One evening, two weeks before the close of the season, Ivy put on her hat and announced that she was going downtown to mail her letters. Mail your letters in the daytime, growled Papa Keller. I didn't have time today, answered Ivy. It was a thirteen-inning game, and it lasted until six o'clock. It was then that Papa Keller banged the heavy fist of decision down on the library table. This thing's got to stop, he thundered. I won't have any girl of mine running the streets with a ball player, understand? Now you quit seeing this seventy-five dollars a month bush leaguer, or leave this house. I mean it. All right, said Ivy, with a white-hot calm. I'll leave. I can make the grandest kind of angel food with marshmallow icing, and you know yourself my fudges can't be equaled. He'll be playing in the major leagues in three years. Why, just yesterday there was a strange man at the game, a city man. You could tell by his hat band and the way his clothes were cut. He stayed through the whole game and never took his eyes off Rudy. I just know he was a scout for the Cubs. Probably a hardware drummer, or a fellow that Schluckweiler owes money to. Ivy began to pin on her hat. A scared look leaped into Papa Keller's eyes. He looked a little old, too, and drawn at that minute. He stretched forth a rather tremulous hand. 
Ivy girl, he said. What? snapped Ivy. Your old father is just talking for your own good. You're breaking your ma's heart. You and me have been good pals, haven't we? Yes, said Ivy, grudgingly and without looking up. Well, now look here. I've got a proposition to make to you. The season's over in two more weeks. The last week they play out of town. Then the boys will come back home for a week or so just to hang around town and try to get used to the idea of leaving us. Then they'll scatter to take up their winter jobs, cutting ice, most of them, he added grimly. Mr. Schlockweiler is employed in a large establishment in Slattersville, Ohio, said Ivy with dignity. He regards baseball as his profession, and he cannot do anything that would affect his pitching arm. Pa Keller put on the tremulo stop and brought a misty look into his eyes. Ivy, you'll do one last thing for your old father, won't you? Maybe, answered Ivy coolly. Don't make that fellow any promises. Now wait a minute, let me get through. I won't put any crimp in your plans, I won't speak to Schlockweiler. Promise you won't do anything rash until the ball season's over. Then we'll wait just one month, see? Till along about November. Then if you feel like you want to see him, but how? Hold on. You mustn't write to him, or see him, or let him write to you during that time, see? Then if you feel the way you do now, I'll take you to Slattersville to see him. Now that's fair, ain't it? Only don't let him know you're coming. Hmm. Yes, said Ivy. Shake hands on it. She did. Then she left the room with a rush, headed in the direction of her own bedroom. Pa Keller treated himself to a prodigious wink and went out to the vegetable garden in search of mother. The team went out on the road, lost five games, won two, and came home in fourth place. For a week they lounged around the Parker Hotel and held up the street corners downtown, took many farewell drinks, then slowly by ones and twos they left for the packing houses, freight depots, and gents' furnishing stores from whence they came. October came in with a blaze of sumac and oak leaves. Ivy stayed home and learned to make veal loaf and apple pies. The worry lines around Pa Keller's face began to deepen. Ivy said that she didn't believe that she cared to go back to Miss Shunt's select school for young ladies. October 31st came. We'll take the 8.15 tomorrow, said her father to Ivy. All right, said Ivy. Do you know where he works? asked he. No, answered Ivy. That'll be all right. I took the trouble to look him up last August. The short November afternoon was drawing to its close, as our best talent would put it, when Ivy and her father walked along the streets of Slattersville, I can't tell you which streets because I don't know, Pa Keller brought up before a narrow little shoe shop. Here we are, he said, and ushered Ivy in. A short, stout, proprietary figure approached them, smiling a mercantile smile. What can I do for you? he inquired. Ivy's eyes searched the shop for a tall, golden-haired form in a soiled baseball suit. Oh, we'd like to see a gentleman named Schlockweiler, uh, Rudolf Schlockweiler, said Pa Keller. Anything very special? inquired the proprietor. He's rather busy just now. Wouldn't anybody else do? Of course, if— No, growled Keller. The boss turned. Hi, Schlockweiler, he bawled toward the rear of the dim little shop. Yes, sir, answered a muffled voice. Front, yelled the boss, and withdrew to a safe listening distance. A vaguely troubled look lurked in the depths of Ivy's eyes. From behind the partition of the rear of the shop emerged a tall figure. It was none other than our hero. He was in his shirt-sleeves, and he struggled into his coat as he came forward, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, hurriedly and swallowing. I have said that the shop was dim. Ivy and her father stood at one side, their backs to the light. Rudy came forward, rubbing his hands together in the manner of clerks. Something in shoes? he politely inquired. Then he saw. Ivy! Ah, uh, Miss Keller! he exclaimed. Then awkwardly, Well, how do, Mr. Keller? I certainly am glad to see you both. How's the old town? What are you doing in Slattersville? Why, Ivy! began Pa Keller, blunderingly. But Ivy clutched his arm with a warning hand. 
The vaguely troubled look in her eyes had become wildly so. Schlockweiler, shouted the voice of the boss. Customers! And he waved a hand in the direction of the fitting benches. All right, sir, answered Rudy. Just a minute. Dad had to come on business, said Ivy hurriedly, and he brought me with him. I'm, uh, I'm on my way to school in Cleveland, you know. Awfully glad to have seen you again. Uh, we must go. That lady wants her shoes, I'm sure, and your employer is glaring at us. Come, Dad. At the door she turned just in time to see Rudy removing the shoe from the pudgy foot of the fat lady customer. We'll take a jump of six months. That brings us into the lap of April. Pa Keller looked up from his evening paper. Ivy, home for the Easter vacation, was at the piano. Ma Keller was sewing. Pa Keller cleared his throat. <clears throat> I see by the paper, he announced, that Schlockweiler's been sold to Des Moines. Too bad we lost him. He was a great little pitcher, but he played in bad luck. Whenever he was on the slab, the boys seemed to give him poor support. Fudge! exclaimed Ivy, continuing to play, but turning a spirited face toward her father. What piffle! Whenever a player pitches rotten ball, you always hear him howling about the support he didn't get. Schlockweiler was a bum pitcher. Anybody could hit him with a willow wand on a windy day with the sun in his eyes. End of A Bush League Hero What She Wore by Edna Ferber this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What She Wore Somewhere in your story you must pause to describe your heroine's costume. It is a ticklish task. The average reader likes his heroine well-dressed. He is not satisfied with knowing that she looked like a tall, fair lily. He wants to be told that her gown was of green crepe, with lace ruffles that swirled at her feet. Writers used to go so far as to name the dressmaker, and it was a poor kind of heroine who didn't wear a red velvet by worth. But that has been largely abandoned in these days of commissions. Still, when the heroine goes out on the terrace to spoon after dinner, a quaint old English custom for the origin of which see any novel by the Duchess, page 179. The average reader wants to know what sort of a filmy wrap she snatches up on the way out. He demands a description, with as many illustrations as the publisher will stand for, of what she wore from the bedroom to the street, with full stops for the ribbons on her robe de nuit and the buckles on her ballroom slippers. Half the poor creatures one sees, flattening their noses against the shop windows, are authors getting a line on the advance fashions. Suppose a careless writer were to dress his heroine in a full pleated skirt, only to find, when his story is published four months later, that full pleated skirts have been relegated to the dim past. I started to read a story once. It was a good story. There was in it not a single allusion to brandy and soda, or divorce, or the stock market. The dialogue crackled. The hero talked like a live man. It was a shipboard story, and the heroine was charming so long as she wore her heavy ulster. But along toward evening she blossomed forth in a yellow gown with a scarlet poinsettia at her throat. I quit her cold. Nobody ever wore a scarlet poinsettia or if they did, they couldn't wear it on a yellow gown, or if they did wear it with a yellow gown, they didn't wear it at the throat. Scarlet poinsettias aren't worn anyhow. To this day, I don't know whether the heroine married the hero or jumped overboard. You see, one can't be too careful about clothing one's heroine. I hesitate to describe Sophie Epstein's dress. You won't like it. In the first place it was cut too low, front and back, for a shoe clerk in a downtown loft. It was a black dress, near princess in style, very tight as to fit, very short as to skirt, very sleazy as to material. It showed all the delicate curves of Sophie's underfed, girlish body, and Sophie didn't care a bit. Its most objectionable feature was at the throat. Collarless gowns were in vogue. Sophie's daring shears had gone a snip 
or two farther. They had cut a startlingly generous V. To say that the dress was elbow-sleeved is superfluous. I have said that Sophie clerked in a downtown loft. Sophie sold sample shoes at two fifty a pair, and from where you were standing you thought they looked just like the shoes that were sold in the regular shops for six. When Sophie sat on one of the low benches at the feet of some customer, tugging away at a refractory shoe for a would-be small foot, her shameless little gown exposed more than it should have. But few of Sophie's customers were shocked. They were mainly chorus girls and ladies of doubtful complexion in search of cheap and ultra footgear and, to use a health term, hardened by exposure. Have I told you how pretty she was? She was so pretty that you immediately forgave her the indecency of her pitiful little gown. She was pretty in a daringly demure fashion, like a wicked little Puritan or a poverty-stricken Cleo de Marode. With her smooth brown hair parted in the middle, drawn severely down over her ears, framing the lovely oval of her face, and ending in a simple coil at the neck. Some serpent's wisdom had told Sophie to eschew puffs, but I think her prettiness could have triumphed even over those. If Sophie's boss had been any other sort of man, he would have informed Sophie sternly that black princess effects cut low were not au fait in the shoe clerk world. But Sophie's boss had a rhombic nose and no instep, and the tail of his name had been amputated. He didn't even care how Sophie wore her dresses, so long as she sold shoes. Once the boss had kissed Sophie, not on the mouth, but just where her shabby gown formed its charming but immodest V. Sophie had slapped him, of course, but the slap had not set the thing right in her mind. She could not forget it. It had made her uncomfortable in much the same way as we are wildly ill at ease when we dream of walking naked in a crowded street. At odd moments during the day Sophie had found herself rubbing the spot furiously with her unlovely handkerchief and shivering a little. She had never told the other girls about that kiss. So there you have Sophie and her costume. You may take her or leave her. I purposely placed these defects in costuming right at the beginning of the story, so that there should be no false pretenses. One more detail. About Sophie's throat was a slender, near-gold chain from which was suspended a cheap and glittering La Valliere. Sophie had not intended it as a sop to the conventions. It was an offering on the shrine of fashion and represented many lunchless days. At eleven o'clock one August morning, Louis came to Chicago from Oskaloosa, Iowa. There was no hay in his hair. The comic papers have long insisted that the country boy, on his first visit to the city, is known by his greased boots and his high-water pants. Don't you believe them? The small-town boy is as fastidious about the height of his heels and the stripe of his shift and the roll of his hat-brim as are his city brothers. He peruses the slangily worded ads of the classy clothes tailors, and when scarlet cravats are worn the small-town boy is not more than two weeks late in acquiring one that glows like a headlight. Louis found a rooming house, shoved his suitcase under the bed, changed his collar, washed his hands in the gritty water of the washbowl, and started out to look for a job. Louis was twenty-one. For the last four years he had been employed in the best shoe store at home, and he knew shoe leather from the factory to the ash barrel. It was almost a religion with him. Curiosity, which plays leads in so many life dramas, led Louis to the rotunda of the tallest building. It was built on the hollow center plan, with a sheer drop from the twenty-somethingth to the main floor. Louis stationed himself in the center of the mosaic floor, took off his hat, bent backwards almost double, and gazed his mouth wide open. When he brought his muscles slowly back into normal position, he tried hard not to look impressed. He glanced about sheepishly, 
to see if anyone was laughing at him, and his eyes encountered the electric-lighted glass display case of the shoe company upstairs. The case was filled with pink satin slippers and cunning velvet boots, and the newest thing in bronze street shoes. Louis took the next elevator up. The shoe display had made him feel as though someone from home had slapped him on the back. The god of the jobless was with him. The boss had fired two boys the day before. Oskaloosa, grinned the boss derisively. Do they wear shoes there? What do you know about shoes, huh, boy? Louis told him. The boss shuffled the papers on his desk and chewed his cigar and tried not to show his surprise. Louis, quite innocently, was teaching the boss things about the shoe business. When Louis had finished, "'Well, I try you anyhow,' the boss grunted grudgingly. "'I give you so and so much.' He named a wage that would have been ridiculous if it had not been so pathetic. "'All right, sir,' answered Louis, promptly, like the boys in the Alger series. The cost of living problem had never bothered Louis in Oskaloosa. The boss hid a pleased smile. "'Miss Epstein,' he bellowed, "'step this way.' "'Miss Epstein, kindly show this here young man so he gets a line on the stock. He is from Oskaloosa, Iowa. Uh, look out she don't sell you a gold brick, Louie.' But Louie was not listening. He was gazing at the V in Sophie Epstein's dress with all his scandalized Oskaloosa, Iowa eyes. Louie was no mollycoddle, but he had been in great demand as usher at the young men's Sunday evening club service at the Congregational Church, and in his hometown there had been no Sophie Epsteins in two tight princess dresses cut into a careless V. But Sophie was a city product. I was about to say pure and simple, but I will not. Wise, bold, young, old, underfed, overworked, and triumphantly pretty. How do? cooed Sophie in her best baby tones. Louis's disapproving eyes jumped from the objectionable V in Sophie's dress to the lure of Sophie's face, and their expression underwent a lightning change. There was no disapproving Sophie's face, no matter how long one had dwelt in Oskaloosa. I won't bite you, said Sophie. I'm never vicious on Tuesdays. We'll start here with the missus and children's and work over to the other side. Whereupon Louis was introduced into the intricacies of the sample shoe business. He kept his eyes resolutely away from the V and learned many things. He learned how shoes that look like six-dollar values may be sold for two-fifty. He looked on in wide-eyed horror while Sophie fitted a number five C shoe on a six B foot and assured the wearer that it looked like a made-to-order boot. He picked up a pair of dull kid shoes and looked at them. His leather-wise eyes saw much, and I think he would have taken his hat off the hook and his offended business principles out of the shop forever if Sophie had not completed her purchase and strolled over to him at the psychological moment. She smiled up at him impudently. "'Well, Pink Cheeks,' she said, "'how do you like our little settlement by the lake, huh?' "'Those shoes aren't worth two fifty said Louis, indignation in his voice. "'Well, sure,' replied Sophie. "'I know it. What do you think this is, a charity bazaar?' "'But back home,' began Louis hotly. "'Forget it, kid,' said Sophie. "'This is a big town, but it ain't got no room for back-homers. Don't sour on one job till you've got another nailed. You'll find yourself cuddling down on a park bench if you do. Uh, say, are you honestly from Oskaloosa?' I certainly am, answered Louis with pride. My goodness, ejaculated Sophie. I never believed there was no such place. Don't brag about it to the other fellows. What time do you go out for lunch? asked Louis. What's it to you? with the accent on the two. When I want to know a thing, I generally ask, explained Louis gently. Sophie looked at him, a long, keen, knowing look. You'll learn, she observed thoughtfully. Louis did learn. He learned so much in that first week that when Sunday came it seemed as though eons had passed over his head. He learned that the crime of murder was as nothing compared to the crime of allowing a customer to depart shoeless. 
he learned that the lunch hour was invented for the purpose of making dates, that no one had ever heard of Oskaloosa, Iowa, that seven dollars a week does not leave much margin for laundry and general recklessness, that a Madonna face above a V-cut gown is apt to distract one's attention from shoes, that a hundred-dollar nest egg is as effective in Chicago as a pine stick would be in propping up a stone wall, and that all the other men clerks called Sophie sweetheart. Some of his newly acquired knowledge brought pain, as knowledge is apt to do. He saw that State Street was crowded with Sophies during the noon hour, girls with lovely faces under pitifully absurd hats, girls who aped the fashions of the dazzling creatures they saw stepping from limousines, girls who starved body and soul in order to possess a set of false curls or a pair of black satin shoes with mother-of-pearl buttons, girls whose minds were bounded on the north by the nickel theaters and on the east by I says to him, on the south by the gorgeous shop windows, and on the west by he says to me, oh, I can't tell you how much Louis learned in that first week while his eyes were getting accustomed to the shifting, jostling, pushing, giggling, walking, talking throng. The city is justly famed as a hothouse of forced knowledge. One thing Louis could not learn. He could not bring himself to accept the V in Sophie's dress. Louis's mother had been one of the old-fashioned kind, who wore a blue and white checked gingham apron from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., when she took it off to go downtown and help the ladies of the church at the cake sale in the empty window of the gas company's office, only to don it again when she fried the potatoes for supper. Among other things, she had taught Louis to wipe his feet before coming in, to respect and help women, and to change his socks often. After a month of Chicago, Louis forgot the first lesson, had more difficulty than I can tell you in reverencing a woman who only said, I don't get fresh now, when the other men put their arms about her, and adhered to the third only after a struggle in which he had to do a small private washing in his own wash bowl in the evening. Sophie called him a stiff. His gravely courteous treatment of her made her vaguely uncomfortable. She was past mistress in the art of parrying insults and banter, but she had no reply ready for Louis's boyish air of deference. It angered her for some unreasonable woman reason. There came a day when the V-cut dress brought them to open battle. I think Sophie had appeared that morning minus the chain and la valier, frail and cheap as it was. It had been the only barrier that separated Sophie from frank shamelessness. Louis's outraged sense of propriety asserted itself. Uh, Sophie, he stammered during a quiet half hour, I'll call for you and take you to the nickel show tonight, if you'll promise not to wear that dress. What makes you wear that kind of a get-up, anyway? Dress? queried Sophie, looking down at the shiny front breadth of her frock. Why, don't you like it? Like it? No, blurted Louis. Don't you really? <laughs> dear me, dear me. If I'd only known that this morning. <laughs> As a general thing, I wear white duck complete down to work, but I'm saving my last two clean suits for golf. Louis ran an uncomfortable finger around the edge of his collar, but he stood his ground. It, it shows your neck so, he objected miserably. Sophie opened her great eyes wide. Well, supposing it does, she inquired coolly. It's a perfectly good neck, ain't it? Louis, his face very red, took the plunge. I don't know. I guess so. But, Sophie, it, it looks so, so, uh, you know what I mean. I hate to see the way the fellows rubber at you. Why don't you wear those plain shirtwaist things with high collars like my mother wears back home? Sophie's teeth came together with a click. She laughed a short, cruel laugh. <laughs> Say, pink cheeks, did you ever do a washing from seven to twelve after you got home from work in the evening? It's great, especially when you're living in a six-by-ten room with all the modern inconveniences. 
including no water except on the third floor down? Simple. Say a child could do it. All you got to do when you get home so tired your back teeth ache is to haul your water and soak your clothes and then rub em till your hands peel and rinse em and boil em and blue em and starch em. See? Just like that. Nothing to it, kid. Nothing to it. Louis had been twisting his fingers nervously. Now his hands shut themselves into fists. He looked straight into Sophie's angry eyes. I do know what it is, he said quite simply. There's been a lot written and said about women's struggle with clothes. I wonder why they've never said anything about the way a man has to fight to keep up the thing they call appearances. God knows it's pathetic enough to think of a girl like you bending over a tub full of clothes. But when a man has to do it, it's a tragedy. That's so, agreed Sophie. When a girl gets shabby and her clothes begin to look tacky, she can take a gore or so out of her skirt, where it's the most wore, and catch it in at the bottom and call it a hobble. And when a waist gets too soiled, she can cover up the front of it with a jabot, and if her face is pretty enough, she can carry it off that way. But when a man is seedy, he's seedy. He can't sew no ruffles on his pants. I ran short last week, continued Louis. That is, shorter than usual. I hadn't the fifty cents to give to the woman. You ought to see her. A little gray-faced thing with wisps of hair and no chest to speak of, and one of those mashed-looking black hats. Nobody could have the nerve to ask her to wait for her money. So I did my own washing. I haven't learned to wear soiled clothes yet. I laughed fit to bust when I was doing it. But I'll bet my mother dreamed of me last night. The way they do, you know, when something's gone wrong. Sophie, perched on the third rung of the sliding ladder, was gazing at him. Her lips were parted slightly, and her cheeks were very pink. On her face was a new, strange look, as of something half-forgotten. It was as though the spirit of Sophie as she might have been were inhabiting her soul for a brief moment. At Louis's next words the look was gone. "'Can't you sew something, uh, a lace yoke, or whatever you call em, in that dress?' he persisted. "'Ah, fade,' jeered Sophie. "'When a girl's only got one dress, it's got to have some tongue to it. Maybe this gown would cause a wave of indignation in Oskaloosa, Iowa, but it don't even make a ripple on State Street. It takes more than an aggravated Dutch neck to make a fellow look at a girl these days. In a town like this a girl's got to make a show in some way. I'm my own stage manager. They look at my dress first, and grin, see? And then they look at my face. I'm like the girl in the story. My face is my fortune. It's earned me many a square meal, and let me tell you, Pink Cheeks, eating square meals is one of my favorite pastimes. Say, look a here, bellowed the boss wrathfully. Just cut out this here Romeo and Julio act, will you? That there ladder ain't for no balcony scene, understand? Here, you, Louie. You shinny up there and get down a pair of them brown satin pumps, small size. Sophie continued to wear the black dress. The V-cut neck seemed more flaunting than ever. It was two weeks later that Louis came in from lunch, his face radiant. He was fifteen minutes late, but he listened to the boss's ravings with a smile. You grin like somebody handed you a tin-case note, commented Sophie with a woman's curiosity. I guess you must have met some rube from home when you was out to lunch. Better than that, who do you think I bumped right into in the elevator going down? Well, Brother Bones, mimicked Sophie, who did you meet in the elevator going down? I met a man named Ames. He used to travel for a big Boston shoe house, and he made our town every few months. We got to be good friends. I took him home for Sunday dinner once, and he said it was the best dinner he'd had in months. Uh, you know how tired those traveling men get of hotel grub. Cut out the description and get down to action, snapped Sophie. Well, he knew me right away, and he made me go out to lunch with him. A real lunch starting with soup. Gee, it went big. He asked me what I was doing. I told him I was working here, and he opened his eyes, and then he laughed and said, How did you get into that joint? Then he took me down to a swell little shoe shop on State Street, and it turned out that he owns it. He introduced me all around, and I'm going there to work next week, and wages. 
Why, say, it's almost a salary. A fellow can hold his head up in a place like that. When you leavin'? asked Sophie, slowly. Monday. Gee, it seems a year away. Sophie was late Saturday morning. When she came in, hurriedly, her cheeks were scarlet and her eyes glowed. She took off her hat and coat and fell to straightening boxes and putting out stock without looking up. She took no part in the talk and jest that was going on amongst the other clerks. One of the men, in search of the missing mate to the shoe in his hand, came over to her, greeting her carelessly. Then he stared. "'Well, what do you know about this?' he called out to the others and laughed coarsely. "'Look, stop, listen. Little Sophie Bright Eyes here has pulled down the shades.' Louis turned quickly. The immodest V of Sophie's gown was filled with a black lace yoke that came up to the very lobes of her little pink ears. She had got some scraps of lace from— where do you get those bits of rusty black? From some basement bargain counter, perhaps, raked over during the lunch hour. There were nine pieces in the front and seven in the back. She had sat up half the night, putting them together so that when completed they looked like one if you didn't come too close. There is a certain strain of Indian patience and ingenuity in women that no man has ever been able to understand. Louis looked up and saw. His eyes met Sophie's. In his there crept a certain exultant gleam, as of one who had fought for something great and won. Sophie saw the look. The shy questioning in her eyes was replaced by a spark of defiance. She tossed her head and turned to the man who had called attention to her costume. "'Who's loony now?' she jeered. "'I always put in a yoke when it gets along toward fall. My lungs is delicate. And anyway, I see by the papers yesterday that collarless gowns is slightly past safe for winter. End of What She Wore The Man Who Came Back by Edna Ferber This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Man Who Came Back there are two ways of doing battle against disgrace. You may live it down, or you may run away from it and hide. The first method is heartbreaking, but sure. The second cannot be relied upon because of the uncomfortable way disgrace has of turning up at your heels just when you think you have eluded her in the last town but one. Ted Terrell did not choose the first method. He had it thrust upon him. After Ted had served his term, he came back home to visit his mother's grave, intending to take the next train out. He wore none of the prison pallor that you read about in books, because he had been shortstop on the penitentiary all-star baseball team, and famed for the dexterity with which he could grab up red-hot grounders. The storied lockstep and the clipped hair effect also were missing. The superintendent of Ted's prison had been one of the reform kind. You would never have picked Ted as a criminal. He had none of those interesting phrenological bumps and depressions that usually are shown to such frank advantage in the Bertillon photographs. Ted had been assistant cashier in the Citizens National Bank. In a mad moment he had attempted a little sleight-of-hand act in which certain citizens' national funds were to be transformed into certain glittering shares and back again so quickly that the examiners couldn't follow it with their eyes. But Ted was unaccustomed to these now-you-see-it-and-now-you-don't feats, and his hand slipped. The trick dropped to the floor with an awful clatter. Ted had been a lovable young kid, six feet high and blonde, with a great reputation as a dresser. He had the first yellow plush hat in our town. It sat on his golden head like a halo. The women all liked Ted. Mrs. Dankworth, the dashing widow, why will widows persist in being dashing, said that he was the only man in our town who knew how to wear a dress suit. The men were forever slapping him on the back and asking him to have a little something. 
Ted's good looks and his clever tongue and a certain charming Irish way he had with him caused him to be taken up by the smart set. Now, if you've never lived in a small town, you will be much amused at the idea of its boasting a smart set, which proves your ignorance. The small town smart set is deadly serious about its smartness. It likes to take six-hour runs down to the city to fit a pair of shoes and hear Caruso. Its clothes are as well made, and its scandals as crisp, and its pace as hasty, and its golf club as dull as the clothes and scandals and pace and golf club of its city cousins. The hasty pace killed Ted. He tried to keep step in a set of young folks whose fathers had made our town, and all the time his pocketbook was yelling, Whoa! The young people ran largely to scarlet upholstered touring cars and country club doings and house parties, as small-town younger generations are apt to. When Ted went to high school, half the boys in his little clique spent their after-school hours dashing up and down Main Street in their big glittering cars, sitting slumped down on the middle of their spines in front of the steering wheel, their sleeves rolled up, their hair combed a militant pompadour. One or the other of them always took Ted along. It is fearfully easy to develop a taste for that kind of thing. As he grew older, the taste took root and became a habit. Ted came out after serving his term, still handsome, spite of all that story writers may have taught to the contrary. But we'll make this concession to the old tradition. There was a difference. His radiant blondeur was dimmed in some intangible, elusive way. Bertie Callahan, who had worked in Ted's mother's kitchen for years, and who had gone back to her old job at Haley House after her mistress's death, put it sadly thus. He was always the handsome devil. I used to look forward to ironing day just for the pleasure of pressing his fancy shirts for him. I'm that partial to them swell blondes. But I dunno, he's changed. Doing time has taken the edge off his hair and complexion. Not changed his color, do you mind? But dulled it, like a gold ring or the like that has tarnished. Ted was seated in the smoker with a chip on his shoulder and a sick horror of encountering someone he knew in his heart when Joe Haley of the Haley House got on the Westport homeward bound. Joe Haley is the most eligible bachelor in our town, and the slipperiest. He has made the Haley House a gem, so that traveling men will cut half a dozen towns to Sunday there. If he should say, jump through this, to any girl in our town, she'd jump. Joe Haley strolled leisurely up the car aisle toward Ted. Ted saw him coming, and sat very still, waiting. Hello, Ted. How's Ted? said Joe Haley casually, and dropped into the adjoining seat without any more fuss. Ted wet his lips slightly and tried to say something. He had been a breezy talker, but the words would not come. Joe Haley made no effort to cover the situation with a rush of conversation. He did not seem to realize that there was any situation to cover. He chomped the end of his cigar and handed one to Ted. Well, you've taken your licking, kid. What are you going to do now? The rawness of it made Ted wince. Oh, I don't know, he stammered. I've got a job, half promised in Chicago. What doing? Ted laughed a short and ugly laugh. <laughs> Driving a brewery auto truck. Joe Haley tossed his cigar dexterously to the opposite corner of his mouth and squinted thoughtfully along its bulging sides. Remember that uh, Wenzel girl that's kept books for me for the last six years? She's leaving in a couple of months to marry a New York guy that travels for ladies' cloaks and suits. After she's gone, it's nix with the lady bookkeepers for me. Not that many isn't a good, straight girl and honest, but no girl can keep books with one eye on a column of figures and the other on a traveling man in a brown suit and a red necktie, unless she's cross-eyed, and you bet many ain't. The job's yours if you want it. Eighty a month to start on, and board. I can't, Joe. Thanks just the same. I'm trying to begin all over again, somewhere else, where nobody knows me. Oh, yes, said Joe. I knew a fellow that did that. 
After he came out, he grew a beard and wore eyeglasses and changed his name, had a quick, crisp way of talking, and he cultivated a drawl, and went west and started a business. Real estate, I think. Anyway, the second month he was there, in walks a fool he used to know and bellows, Why, if it ain't Bill! Hello, Bill! I thought you was doing time yet. That was enough. Ted, you can block your face and dye your hair and squint, and some fine day, sooner or later, somebody'll come along and blab the whole thing. And say, the older it gets, the worse it sounds when it does come out. Stick around here where you grew up, Ted. Ted clasped and unclasped his hands uncomfortably. I can't figure out why you should care how I finish. No reason, answered Joe. Not a darned one. I wasn't ever in love with your ma like the guy on the stage, and I never owed your pa a cent, so it ain't a guilty conscience. I guess it's just pure cussedness and a hankering for a new investment. I'm curious to know how you'll turn out. You've got the makings of what the newspapers call a leading citizen, even if you did fall down once. If I'd ever had time to get married, which I never will have, a first-class hotel being more worry and expense than a Pittsburgh steel magnate's whole harem, I'd have wanted somebody to do the same for my kid. That sounds slushy, but it's straight. I don't seem to know how to thank you, began Ted, a little husky as to voice. Call around tomorrow morning, interrupted Joe Haley briskly, and Minnie Wenzel will show you the ropes. You and her can work together for a couple of months. After then she's leaving to make her underwear and that. I should think she'd have a bale of it by this time. Been embroidering them shimmy things and lunch cloths back of the desk when she thought I wasn't looking for the last six months. Ted came down next morning at 8 a.m. with his nerve between his teeth and the chip still balanced lightly on his shoulder. Five minutes later Minnie Wenzel knocked it off. When Joe Haley introduced the two jocularly, knowing that they had originally met in the first reader room, Miss Wenzel acknowledged the introduction icily by lifting her left eyebrow slightly and drawing down the corners of her mouth. Her air of hauteur was a triumph, considering that she was handicapped by black sateen sleevelets. I wonder how one could best describe Miss Wenzel. There is one of her in every small town. Let me think. Business of hand on brow. Well, she always paid eight dollars for her corsets when most girls in a similar position got theirs for fifty-nine cents in the basement. Nature had been kind to her. The hair that had been a muddy brown in Minnie's schoolgirl days, it had touched with a magic red-gold wand. Bertie Callahan always said that Minnie was working only to wear out her old clothes. After the introduction, Miss Wenzel followed Joe Haley into the lobby. She took no pains to lower her voice. Well, I must say, Mr. Haley, you've got a fine nerve. If my gentleman friend was to hear of my working with an ex-con, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd break off the engagement. I should think you'd have some respect for the feelings of a lady with a name to keep up and engaged to a swell fellow like Mr. Schwartz. Say, listen, my girl, replied Joe Haley, the law don't cover all the tricks, but if stuffing an order was a criminal offense, I'll bet your swell traveling man would be doing a life term. Ted worked that day with his teeth set so that his jaws ached next morning. Minnie Wenzel spoke to him only when necessary and then in terms of dollars and cents. When dinner time came, she divested herself of the black sateen sleevelets, wriggled from the shoulders down a la Patricia O'Brien, produced a chamois skin, and disappeared in the direction of the washroom. Ted waited until the dining room was almost deserted. Then he went in to dinner alone. Someone in white, wearing an absurd little pocket handkerchief of an apron, led him to a seat in a far corner of the big room. Ted did not lift his eyes higher than the snowy square of the apron. The apron drew out a chair, shoved it under Ted's knees in the way aprons have, and thrust a printed menu at him. Roast beef medium, said Ted without looking up. 
Bless your heart, you ain't changed a bit. I remember how you used to jaw when it was too well done, said the apron fondly. Ted's head came up with a jerk. So you will cut your old friends, is it? grinned Bertie Callahan. If this wasn't a public drawing room, maybe you'd shake hands with a poor but proud working girl. You're as good looking a devil as ever, Mr. Ted. Ted's hand shot out and grasped hers. Bertie, I could weep on your apron. I never was so glad to see anyone in my life. Just to look at you makes me homesick. What in Sam Hill are you doing here? Waitin'. After your ma died, it seemed like I didn't care to work for no other private family, so I came back here in my old job. I'll bet I'm the homeliest head waitress in captivity. Ted's nervous fingers were pleating the tablecloth. His voice sank to a whisper. Bertie, tell me the God's truth. Did those three years cause her death? Never, lied Bertie. I was with her to the end. It started with a cold on the chest. Have some french fry with your beef, Mr. Teddy. They're illigent today. Bertie glided off to the kitchen. Authors are fond of the word glide, but you can take it literally this time. Bertie had a face that looked like a huge mistake, but she walked like a panther, and there said to be the last cry as gliders. She walked with her chin up and her hips firm. That comes from juggling trays. You have to walk like that to keep your nose out of the soup. After a while the walk becomes a habit. Any seasoned dining-room girl could give lessons in walking to the Deslart teacher of an Eastern finishing school. From the day that Bertie Callahan served Ted with the roast beef medium and the elegant French fried, she appointed herself monitor over his food and clothes and morals. I wish I could find words to describe his bitter loneliness. He did not seek companionship. The men, although not directly avoiding him, seemed somehow to have pressing business whenever they happened in his vicinity. The women ignored him. Mrs. Dankworth, still dashing and still widowed, passed Ted one day and looked fixedly at a point one inch above his head. In a town like ours, the Haley House is like a big hospitable clubhouse. The men drop in there the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night to hear the gossip and buy a cigar and jolly the girl at the cigar counter. Ted spoke to them when they spoke to him. He began to develop a certain grim line about the mouth. Joe Haley watched him from afar, and the longer he watched, the kinder and more speculative grew the look in his eyes. And slowly and surely there grew in the hearts of our townspeople a certain new respect and admiration for this boy who was fighting his fight. Ted got into the habit of taking his meals late, so that Bertie Callahan could take the time to talk to him. Bertie, he said one day, when she brought his soup, do you know that you're the only decent woman who'll talk to me? Do you know what I mean when I say I'd give the rest of my life if I could just put my head in my mother's lap and have her muss up my hair and call me foolish names? Bertie Callahan cleared her throat and said abruptly, I was noticing yesterday your gray pants need pressing bad. Bring em down tomorrow morning and I'll give em the elegant crease in the laundry. So the first weeks went by, and the two months of Miss Wenzel's stay came to an end. Ted thanked his God and tried hard not to wish that she was a man so that he could punch her head. The day before the time appointed for her departure she was closeted with Joe Haley for a long, long time. When finally she emerged, a bellboy lounged up to Ted with a message. Wenzel says the old man wants to see you. Send his office. Say, Mr. Terrell, do you think they can play today? It's pretty wet. Joe Haley was sunk in the depths of his big leather chair. He did not look up as Ted entered. Sit down, he said. Ted sat down and waited, puzzled. As a wizard at figures, mused Joe Haley at last, softly as though to himself, I'm a frost. A column of figures on paper makes my head swim, but I can carry a whole regiment of them in my head. I know every time the barkeep draws one in the dark. I've been watching this thing for the last two weeks, hoping you'd quit and come and tell me. He turned suddenly and faced Ted. Ted, old kid, he said sadly, 
What in the hell made you do it again? What's the joke? asked Ted. Now, Ted, remonstrated Joe Haley, that way of talking won't help matters none. As I said, I'm rotten at figures, but you're the first investment that ever turned out bad, and let me tell you, I've handled some mighty bad-smelling ones. Why, kid, if you had just come to me on the quiet and asked for the loan of a hundred or so, why— What's the joke, Joe? said Ted again, slowly. This ain't my notion of a joke, came the terse answer. We're three hundred short. The last vestige of Ted Terrell's old-time radiance seemed to flicker and die, leaving him ashen and old. Short? he repeated. Then, my God! in a strangely colorless voice. My God! He looked down at his fingers, impersonally, as though they belonged to someone else. Then his hand clutched Joe Haley's arm with the grip of fear. Joe! Joe! That's the thing that has haunted me night and day, till my nerves are raw. The fear I'm doing it again. Don't laugh at me, will you? I used to lie awake nights going over that cursed business of the bank over and over, till the cold sweat would break out all over me. I used to figure it all out again, step by step, until— Joe, could a man steal and not know it? Could thinking of a thing like that drive a man crazy? Because if it could, if it could, then— I don't know, said Joe Haley, but it sounds darn fishy. He had a hand on Ted's shaking shoulder and was looking into the white, drawn face. I had great plans for you, Ted, but Minnie Wenzel's got it all down on slips of paper. I might as well call her in again, and we'll have the whole blame thing out. Minnie Wenzel came. In her hands were slips of paper and books with figures in them and Ted looked and saw things written in his own hand that should not have been there, and he covered his shamed face with his two hands and gave thanks that his mother was dead. There came three sharp raps at the office door. The tense figures within jumped nervously. "'Keep out!' called Joe Haley, whoever you are. Whereupon the door opened, and Bertie Callahan breezed in. "'Get out, Bertie Callahan!' roared Joe. "'You're in the wrong pew.' Bertie closed the door behind her, composedly, and came farther into the room. "'Pete the pastry cook just tells me that Minnie Wenzel told the day clerk, who told the barkeep, who told the janitor, who told the chef, who told Pete, that Minnie had caught Ted stealing some three hundred dollars.' "'Bertie, for heaven's sake, keep out of this. You can't make things any better.' You may believe in me, but where's the money? asked Bertie. Ted stared at her a moment, his mouth open ludicrously. Why, I don't know, he articulated painfully. I never thought of that. Bertie snorted defiantly. I thought so. Do you know, sociably, I was visiting with my aunt Miss Mulcahy last evening. There was a quick rustle of silks from Minnie Wenzel's direction. "'Say, look here,' began Joe Haley impatiently. "'Shut up, Joe Haley,' snapped Bertie. "'As I was saying, I was visiting with my aunt, Miss Mulcahy. She does fancy washing and ironing for the swells. And Minnie Wenzel here, being nun sweller, hires her to do up her wedding linens. Such smears and hand embroidery and Irish crochet she never see the likes, Miss Mulcahy says, and she's seen a lot.' And as a special treat to the poor old soul, why, Minnie Wenzel lets us see some of her wedding clothes. There never yet was a woman who could resist showing her wedding things to every other woman she could lay hands on. Well, Miss Mulcahy, she see that grand trousseau, and she said she never saw the beat. Dresses, well, her going away suit alone comes to eighty dollars, thought being made by Mulkowski, the little Polish tailor and her wedding dress is satin, do you mind? Oh, it was a real treat for my aunt, Miss Mulcahy. Bertie walked over to where Minnie Wenzel sat, very white and still, and pointed a stubby red finger in her face. "'Tis the grand manager, y'all, Miss Wenzel, getting satins and tailor-maids on your salary. It takes a woman, Minnie Wenzel, to see through a woman's tricks." "'Well, I'll be dinged,' exploded Joe Haley. "'You'd better be,' retorted Bertie Callahan. Minnie Wenzel stood up, her lip caught between her teeth. 
Am I to understand, Joe Haley, that you dare to accuse me of taking your filthy money instead of that miserable ex-con there who has done time? That'll do, Minnie, said Joe Haley gently. That's a plenty. Prove it, went on Minnie, and then looked as though she wished she hadn't. A business college education is a grand fine thing, observed Bertie. Miss Wenzel is a graduate of one. They'll teach you everything from drawing birds with tail feathers to plain and fancy penmanship. In fact, they teach everything to the writing line except forgery, and I ain't so sure they haven't got a course in that. I don't care, whimpered Minnie Wenzel suddenly, sinking in a limp heap on the floor. I had to do it. I'm marrying a swell fellow, and a girl's got to have some clothes that don't look like a bird-centered dressmaker's work. He's got three sisters, I saw their pictures, and they're coming to the wedding. They're the kind that wear low-neck dresses in the evening and have their hairs and nails done downtown. I haven't got a thing but my looks. Could I go to New York dressed like a rube? On the square, Joe, I worked here six years and never took a sou. But things got away from me. The tailor wouldn't finish my suit unless I paid him fifty dollars down. I only took fifty at first and intended to pay it back. Honest to goodness, Joe, I did. Cut it out, said Joe Haley, and get up. I was going to give you a check for your wedding, though I hadn't counted on no three hundred. We'll call it square, and I hope you'll be happy, but I don't gamble on it. You'll be going through your man's pants pockets before you're married a year. You can take your hat and fade. I'd like to know how I'm ever going to square this thing with Ted and Bertie. And me standing here gassing while them fool girls in the dining room can't set a table decent and dinner in less than ten minutes, cried Bertie, rushing off. Ted mumbled something unintelligible and was after her. Bertie, I, I want to talk to you. Say it quick, then, said Bertie over her shoulder. The door's open in three minutes. I can't tell you how grateful I am. This is no place to talk to you. Will you let me walk home with you tonight after your work's done? "'Will I?' said Bertie, turning to face him. "'I will not. The swell mob has shook you, and a good thing it is. You was traveling with a bunch of racers when you was only built for medium speed. Now you've got your chance to a fresh start, and don't you ever think I'm going to be the one to let you spoil it by beginning to walk out with a dining-room Lizzie like me.' "'Don't say that, Bertie,' Ted put in. "'It's the truth,' affirmed Bertie. "'Not that I ain't a perfectly respectable girl, and you know it. I'm a good slob, but folks would be tickled for the chance to say that you had nobody to go with but the likes of me. If I was to let you walk home with me tonight, you might be asking to call next week. Inside half a year, if you was lonesome enough, you'd ask me to bury you. And Begora, she said softly, looking down at her unlovely red hands, I'm dead scared I'd do it. Get back to work, Ted Terrell, and hold your head up high, and when you say your prayers tonight, Thank your lucky stars I ain't a hussy. End of The Man Who Came Back End of this collection of short stories by Edna Ferber Read by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, September 2012